Please welcome to the stage WWD's Executive Editor of Strategic Content, Arthur Zakowitz, accompanied by Norma Kamali, President of Norma Kamali, and Lisa Gersh, CEO of Alexander Wang. Hey. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Samsung, for hosting us here. And uh, thank you, uh, Norma and Lisa. It's, uh, I'm kind of humbled and grateful for you guys showing up. Um, these are very inspirational business leaders today. I, I really uh, say that. I love the photo of you in the Daily News yesterday. I saw was, a digital version of Lisa? it. <laughs> and, um, it, it was on hashtag activism, which I think we're going to talk about first. I think that's uh, an incredible time uh, today. So as women leaders in business, uh, what's your perspective on hashtag activism as it relates to Me Too or, or others that are occurring? Um, Lisa, you have a media background, right? You were at Oxygen, right? That was a yes. child. Yes, yes, you yes. Were, and then, wait, uh, Martha Stewart on Lee? Yes. And then... Goop. Goop, goop. We were yeah. just talking about Goop before. No, look, the, the Me Too hashtag and, the, and what's happened since really basically October when it started with Harvey is pretty interesting when you think about it because, look, it's galvanized a movement and I think it's forever changed the workplace for the better. No, no question about it. And, you know, I think when I first started my career, which before Oxygen was as a lawyer, I think a lot of people felt about that kind of behavior. I mean, not some of the behavior, but some of the sort of banter that goes on in an office is like, boys will be boys. That's changed. That's not going to be the way workplaces are conducted anymore, and I think that's great. I do, and I know people don't really want to say this from time to time, gets concerned, this is probably my legal background, about the lack of due process here, which every person is entitled to. Um, and I, I know that's controversial, and I know there are some instances where it's so, it's so evident, but we do live our lives in other respects with that. So I hope some of that gets infiltrated into what's going on. I think I saw today that Ross Levinson had been cleared, whatever that means. And, you know, maybe that's right and maybe it's wrong, but it is good to see that in some instances there is some level of due process. And it's great to see a galvan galvanization of women coming forward and putting an end to something that really did never belonged in the workplace. And it's, it, I mean, it's fueled by social media, right? This is, you know, this was impossible 20 years ago. Like, the level and the, the, mm -hmm. the degree of kind of uh, engagement, I would say, right? Yeah. Do you agree, Norma? Or? Yeah. I'm, um, eight years ago, I started a campaign to stop objectification. And, um, and I also started my radio show, and what I was doing was asking women to share their stories of objectification. And it was very difficult for a lot of women to talk about. It was difficult for me to talk about things that have happened through the years. And I decided that when I started to talk about them, I felt that that secret sort of set me free. And we're objectified every day. I mean, uh, this mansplaining thing has got to end, like, immediately, because every day it still exists. So where are we today? Thank goodness for social media and activism and loud voices and anger and shaming. However, however, exactly what Lisa was saying is, in order to create change, we must communicate and listen to men. We have to hear what they're thinking. Most men are fearful right now. They don't know what to say, how to act. They, I have meetings, they're like, um, can I hug you, kiss you, <laughs> shake your hand, what do we do? And it's like, and they're kidding, but they're not. And so now we need to start having a conversation, making, it clear that there's a lot of pain that we still feel. And I think by telling our fathers, husbands, sisters, I mean, brothers, and the men in our lives about the details of how painful objectification is, 
or the situations, they will become advocates for us. So if you tell a dad, just like that dad in the courtroom over yeah. the, how infuriated he was, if you tell a dad about a date you were on and what happened that was embarrassing and humiliating or what your boss did, or you really tell the detail, your father is an advocate. He will be your advocate and an advocate for women. He will make sure his son and men he works with. So it's this communication on a very intimate level that needs to really begin again. So I'm going back to my radio show again, and I think um, it's an important time. So you said it was difficult for you to kind of express. Yeah, still it, is. <clears throat> still is. And still it's, is. It's, is it the social environment? Is it... No, it's, it's um, women are, women have so many self-esteem issues. I've been doing this since 1967, and you know, too. We, we all have self-esteem issues, no matter how powerful and strong you are or how successful I feel in my own skin. I still, we still, we all feel not 100% great. We're all, we all have these sort of issues. And the more of these secrets we have that have humiliated us and embarrassed us, the harder it is for us to feel empowered, strong self-esteem. So this humiliation is so painful that it's very hard to tell the story, some of them especially face to face. So I've done group interactions, but it doesn't matter if you name the man or name that person. If you get out the story, it is so helpful. I've told many of my stories, but there are some I'm still struggling with. And they're not all workplace stories. And I'm sure there are stories that you would have a hard time talking about, too. And we, we have mouths. We're not, you know, we're not shy. And you're both successful businesswomen, yet we, there is still a glass ceiling over the industries, both in media and fashion. There's still um, challenges. It's astonishing to, to hear that, you know, it's, um, you have, you struggle with um, uh, the environment. This is the social environment. The ecosystem of, of uh, gender is still a difficult place. You know, I think Norm makes the best point because there was an article yesterday about, I think in the Wall Street Journal, about women on corporate boards and how still how few women there are on public company corporate boards and how hard it is for a woman to get on a public company board. And I sit on a public company board and I was the second woman on the board and now the board is 50-50. And the reason that the board is 50-50 is two reasons. One, the CEO made it his mission to put more women on the board. So when you talk about talking to men and making sure they understand how you feel, that's definitely half the solution. And it's the other women on the board saying, the next board member needs to be a woman. It needs to be a woman. We have to do that. And so I think that whole conversation, and what's, I think, the most interesting part about this is the conversation that it's opened and created and allowed people to have, allowed people to feel somewhat more comfortable to raise their hand and say, yes, I had that experience, because clearly we weren't doing that. You can tell by the floodgates that have opened. So within your, uh, each of your own uh, businesses, how do you do that? How do you get that conversation going? Well, um, I, I just want to follow up a little bit here. M needs to be a woman is, is really important. But we know that this doesn't have to be a ger generous gift we have enough qualified women, so it can be a qualified woman. Of course. It's not a gift, a token. We don't want tokens. We have so many brilliant women who have so much to offer, so we don't want gifts. We just want it to be fair. So your question was... What yeah, like within your own organization, like how do, you, how do you get that conversation going? How do you be the change that mm -hmm. you're talking about? Well, I, I think actions speak louder than words. My company is probably 95% women. Um, and so there's a behavior that is very much 
what I'm projecting. And people that tend to be drawn to my company are in the same headset or, or want to be and haven't yet gotten into it. So uh, I think that there's a sensibility that each company has. And if you have a, a company that's almost all women, um, it's so easy because we talk about things. Things happen. Um, we could be on a conference call and some guy is mansplaining and we're like, uh, not going to happen. And so now we say, you've mansplained that beautifully to us. Thank you so much. And it's like, oh, okay. You know, so we just do it. We just talk it and, and act it. I also I like what you said, just winding back to the uh, the father. Uh, so if, if you recall, it was the um, <clears throat> it was the doctor who was uh, yeah. abusing. It was in court. His daughters both were yes. um, abused, and he was hearing that testimony for the first time, and it enraged him. But that's interesting. It, it starts with the man, really. Mm -hmm. If you want that that sort of change, if we want permanent change, if we want permanent change, because it's very hard to tell someone who is not emotionally invested in, in that pain or in that situation, well, you have to behave this way, and then they mechanically do it, and they're going to make a mistake, and they're never going to know right. if they're doing it right. But if they know their daughter was treated this way, that pain is probably worse for the dad or the husband or the, the whoever that caring male is, um, and that that will be so permanent that change will really happen in that way. I, I have a, a daughter who's going to be 13 uh -oh. in two weeks. I'm terrified. Yes. Thanks. Well, I'm terrified. That's the luck with you that. Can you can't her. lock them away. No, you can ask her now if she's sure. been objectified, and, yeah. and I bet she has, right? It's very early. It starts, it starts, early. starts really early. So um, how do you both, uh, and this kind of dovetails into what we were just talking about, how do you cultivate leadership within each of your organizations? Let's start with Lisa. Um, you know, I think you start with the premise that, especially if you're running a company, that everyone who's directly reporting to you that... Uh, how many employees first? I, I 250. Okay, 250. That everyone who directly reports to you, their next job should be CEO. And if you, you start with that premise and you actually tell them that, um, my job is to make you... A CEO. That should be the next thing you're doing. If you're the president of something reporting to a CEO or your EVP, that should be your next job. And then you do that really by, you know, setting goals for them, giving them a really long leash, holding them accountable, letting them make sense, but letting them make mistakes and often being a, learning how to deal with that, I think, especially when they're on a long leash, is the first sign of real leadership to me. Someone who's made its mistakes, walks in my office, says, oh my god, we have a problem. I did this. Let's fix this. That's a leader. That's someone who's really ready to move to the next level to me. And how would you describe like the, the culture of the company? Is it you guys more um, it, kind of like Google or the, more like um, you, Tesla? Or? You know, <laughs> that's interesting. I mean, I've never worked for those companies, so I don't really know their culture that well. But I would say... You know, this is a company that's been around for 13 years. Um, it's the first time in the company's hi history there's really been outside management. Um, and so trying to take a company that's been family run and evolve it into a company that is more, has more of a professional management team is really what we've set out to do. But it's such, a, it's such an amazing opportunity because on the one hand, you want to get it to run like a startup fast, nimble, thinking quickly. But on the other hand, you're not trying to build a brand at the same time and go out and raise venture capital money, which is all the really hard stuff that startups have to do. So it's, it's really a gift of an opportunity. How would you have a very uh, collaborative environment? Mm -hmm. um, you've grown over time. What were some of the early pain points when you were first starting? Um, I would say, I, I want to answer your other question, sure. too, because we have very different companies. And um, I, I have 45 people, and that's my top out That's point. capacity. But it's like, after 45, I feel like it loses the, that sort of freshness. And so I try to keep that. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't work with outside people, too, but in the core. 
And my, a lot of what you said is totally the rule. And when people come in and tell you they made a mistake, you know you have a, a great person. When they're throwing somebody else under the bus, it's like, where's the bus that I can throw you <laughs> under? It's like, what? But, um, but what I do that I find really um, I, I, exciting for me is I really push, gently push people out of the box that they're comfortable in. I really push them to see, when I feel that this person has such potential in some other areas or more than what they're doing, um, and I push them and push them until they're feeling, oh my god, <laughs> and whether they fail or succeed, it doesn't matter because success happens from that. They learn a lot. They're always better. Um, it's very rare that someone says, I quit, I can't do this. It's very rare. And I'm calculating about who I'm pushing and when I'm doing it. But the, the outcome is so magnificent because then I really have somebody that is sort of empowered in a way they never thought they could be, and now they can do anything. So you know what's, can I just say one thing about that I find really interesting? It's, I love doing that to people going, and you're going to do this one other yeah, thing. Yeah. When someone comes to me and says, and I want to do this other thing, and they haven't yet done the thing I asked that, them to do, exactly. that's the worst. Yes. Like, first, do the job I asked right. you to do, and then we're going right. to talk about the next five things. Yeah. And I find a lot of times with certain... Don't say it. I won't. Don't say it. <laughs> there is this, oh my God, I've done this for six months and now it's time right. for me to do something new. That's not yeah. the best. Yeah. Um, and, and you both said like a long leash. I mean, yeah. you, do you mean that or do you mean like support? You mean like control or support? No, I mean go run and I'm not going to ask you every single day whether you did what I asked you to do. That's the long leash. The short leash is I call you and I'm like, how'd the phone call go? What's the next step? Yeah. Before they have an opportunity to perform, I find that makes lends to really bad performances. If you're constantly checking in, you like need to let people go run and do their thing at their own pace. And Norma, you push them, but you're there to support them when they fail. Yeah, um, but I, I love pushing and seeing what happens. And it's just, uh, it's, it's always great. I have to say, it's one of the best things I've, on through the years, and the the good news is that we ought to, I, I have this like reunion kind of thing. There are groups from each decade <laughs> I see, I have dinner with, and then I hear how they've taken what they did with me and what they're doing now, and I, it's just so, it makes me feel so good. I love the, the result for me and how they all grow on their own too. What's um, giving both of yours kind of perspective on on the industry over decades, let's say? What, what's changed? What's the biggest change now as compared to maybe ten years ago? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, everything. 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 everything is the right answer. Yeah. But think about what was around ten years and what wasn't: Snapchat, Instagram, Uber, WeWork, Airbnb. Not even started. 10 years ago. They're some of the biggest companies in the world today. I mean, they're the most impactful in the media space. It's just, you can't, and the price of Amazon stock, which is what, up above 1400s, probably was somewhere between 50 and $75 a share. This is a really different world than it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, Lehman and Bear Stearns still existed. I mean, it's a really different world. The, the world had not gone through the up and down of a financial <laughs> collapse. And I think that all of those things and the rise of these companies in that environment makes operating a business today so incredibly different because you don't really know where it's coming from. Like Snapchat appeared and then everybody worried about what was going to happen to Instagram and Uber appears and then Airbnb appears and what's going to happen to the hotel industry. Mm -hmm. Airbnb has more rooms than all of the large hotel companies combined. Yeah. That's it. That's in the last five years. So I think part of running a business today that's so complicated is where is it coming from? 
and really being able to keep your own head down and say, okay, I do this and I do this really well, and there's definitely going to be change, and what change do I need to pay attention to in order to operate my business? Yeah, I, I think keeping um, the authenticity of your brand, but still um, taking the advantage of change where that change is going to enhance what you do and how you present what you do uh, in a way that you've never done before. In, in fact, if you're doing everything the same way you were doing it 10 years ago, you're probably not in business right now. It's probably and true. So if I look at everything I'm doing, including you know, in the design room, from making, uh, creating a design to presenting it, there, uh, I can just pretty much say everything is different. There are words that we use now that weren't invented then. You can actually, I always have this conversation, you can have a conversation using all of the words you just said, add in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin <laughs> and a couple of other things, and you're, you're speaking a language that people 10 years ago would not know what you were, like, what is this? And, and the technology, too, like, you know, we, yeah. I mean, I have a mobile device in my hand. Like, what was life before that? Like, I don't remember. Well, there were no iPads 10 years ago. That's the first thing I can tell you, because they didn't come out until about 2011. And the other interesting thing, the thing I always think about is Wi-Fi. It's like, we all expect every place we go for there to be Wi-Fi. And when there's not, we're like, you have the face on, you're going in an airplane, is the Wi-Fi working? And when they say no, I'm like, I remember, yeah. like five years ago, taking a plane, <laughs> and there was no Wi-Fi. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. You're expected to be connected at every minute of the day, and you're expected to be able to be connected to your customers, to your employees, definitely to your kids. I mean, the connectivity that's happened in the last 10 years, to me, is the single biggest change. How, how does that, so you, you have an online store that's, I mean, you really, you need E-commerce, yeah. And for me, um, it's very interesting because I'm 100 and I have like a very long history with technology. Um, my first job, I'm gonna tell you an objectification, a side story. My first job out of the fashion industry um, I graduated FIT. I was um, at my first job interview. I had my portfolio. I wanted to be an illustrator. I go into this guy's office on 7th Avenue. He and I spent time thinking about my outfit, the portfolio, everything, you know, thought over and over. And he's got his feet up on his desk. He's eating a tuna sandwich. And he says, young lady, put your portfolio down over there. And he said, come here and turn around for me. And I was like, oh my God. And I could hear my mother saying, get a job, get a job, get a job. And so I went over to him and I turned around. And I, I was so humiliated. I ran out of the office and I just thought, oh my God, that was so horrible. I never told anybody about it. I went to the New York Times, which is where you would normally look for a job at the time, and I saw airlines um, travel. You could work in the office. I didn't know how to type. I didn't know how to do anything that wasn't art. I got a job at Northwest Orient Airlines working on a Univac computer in 1965. Wow. And I had no idea that I was in this magical thing, except I noticed that I could find out all these things that were going on on the plane and whatever. And of course, we still had to put our little handwritten cards in a conveyor belt to, just in case it broke down. So fast forward, communication then was teletype. Then it was fax. Then it was a computer that took a really long time and that circle would go and go and go and you go, oh, let me get a cup of coffee while well, this is it. And then to where we are now, which is total magic. I am so grateful, thank you, thank you. I love this. However, 
my big challenge, and I think all of our challenges, we must put our phones to bed when we go to bed. We need to put them in a little blanket and put them in another room and say, go to sleep. Do not infect my brain with all the thoughts that will contaminate the humanness that exists within me. Um, the, um, <clears throat> I guess we have a lot of um, aspiring and kind of career path um, people in the room thinking about the career path. What advice would you give our, our audience here about um, if they want to break into media or fashion or retail? Well, I took the longest route possible. Um, I was a lawyer for 13 years. Then I started a cable network, which was a good way to get in the media business, but not a good way to get into the fashion business if that's what you want to do. Um, so, I, you know, I think the thing for me, the most important thing about career decisions is courage and really believing that you can do things. And I think, um, you know, I, I, when I was a lawyer, I, I wasn't even an entertainment lawyer, and a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to start a cable network. That's how I got into the business, and I said, sure, seems like fun. Um, and I think that starts when you actually do something, I think this enormous point earlier, that's out of your comfort zone. And if you get that one bit of experience under your belt and you actually do it, you start to believe you can do anything, which may be silly, but you do. I mean, when I was um, 13 years old, my parents um, had a small business that went bankrupt. And I decided that I really needed a job, but I was 13 years old. So I opened up the local newspaper, which is what you would do in those days, and saw that if I took five classes, I could umpire girls softball and get paid $5 a game, which when I was 13 seemed like a lot of money because it was an hour for a game. And I went to the five classes, and I umpired girls softball. They were all 15 and 16 years old, but I was the umpire because it didn't have an age qualification. It sort of told me very early on, I was like, hmm, I could do this. Like, you get that courage, and the more things you do like that before you get to your ultimate career path, where you just go out and do things. Like, the first time I got a job as a waitress when I was 17, I lied about my age and said I had experience, and I got fired the first day, because I had no idea what I was doing. But the second job I already had, now I had experience, because I worked one day, <laughs> and I kind of understood, like, what you were supposed to do. And I, you know, so you do things that you don't think you can do when you try, especially when you're younger. And then when you get to a point when someone says to you, would you like to go run Alexander Wang, you go, oh, I've never run a fashion brand, but I'm pretty sure I can figure that out. And I'd really like to do that. And I love the brand and I love the business, so I'm going to do that. So that would be my advice. Um, advice for fashion. I think, you know, if you are driven beyond anything you can think about, that this is what you want to do, and you have something unique that somebody else doesn't have, and you're willing to be in there for the long haul, and you're willing to fail and be humiliated and embarrassed because of your own actions, maybe, um, then I say do it. And it's not just because of the time, I'd just say, in general, I would always say that. When you add in where we are today in the fashion industry, I think it's very important to keep in mind that fashion may not be as important in the way we remembered it in the past as it, today as it was. I think in the 70s, fashion was the most important thing. Fashion, like everything else, is part of a big sort of puzzle. It's not the puzzle. So if you can understand how fashion relates to women and their lifestyles today, if you can understand how fashion relates to fitness, health, and beauty, it makes sense. All of that is integrated now. It's not this industry that's sort of so special and blocked off. We're not that monolith that we were in the 70s, and I think it's a good thing. 
I think, like everything else, we have to be inventive now. We have to think out of the box. We have to do things that are different. So besides being motivated off the charts because you have to be something in the industry, um, you better have a sense of the world, which means you should be listening to finance when finance channels or reading about things that have to do with business, not just fashion. I never thought of myself as a business person ever. I still don't. But I am definitely listening and learning about every new thing that happens in business or in finance or in the stock market or what's happening, what's not happening, in politics, whether we like it or not. And you must be well-rounded. You can't only speak fashion because you, you just won't be able to do it. You must go outside the borders, which is why someone from another world of business can move into fashion, but it's much harder for you to move into that. So you need to combine the both. Any, any um, notable books, movies, films that you've seen recently that you said, hmm, this is uh, worth noting and this is uh, inspiring? Wow. Um, hmm. Or none. Maybe there was nothing. Was the, the recent one, um, there was HBO. It's... Um, it's Jimmy Iovine, what's the name of it, and, and uh, Dre. It was the Defiant Ones. That is something worth watching. Okay. It's really worth watching. It's really interesting about how that business came together. It's very transparent um, and really, and you'll like Eminem again at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Any places you find inspiration? Places. Um, I, I find... Um, I think New York still is very inspirational because it's moving so quickly and there's just a flow of a variety of people. One of the interesting things to think about now is in the 70s, the, and I've been thinking about this a lot, which is why I keep bringing up the 70s. In the 70s, New York was bankrupt. and. It was the most dangerous place you could think of. I would walk down the center of the street after 6 o'clock because I was afraid to walk on the sidewalks, literally. And my building would get broken into once a month. Uh, store windows broken all the time. So it was very tough, and people were moving out of the city, and rents were dropping dramatically, and a lot of young creative people were coming to New York because they could afford to live here. And the gay culture just was just beginning and it blossomed here because everyone from a small town would come to New York to be in a different world, to identify themselves in a different way. And for different reasons, I feel like this is a similar time where there's a lot of new creative spirit, maybe not in the same way, but I think that there's a lot of talent that, in whether it's through technology or ingenious inventions, um, that can happen in a place like this. And I think people like Jeff Bezos, love him or not, we're talking genius. We're talking all these geniuses who are inspiring us um, because of their creative thought. Some of the things they do may shake us up, but the fact that they're thinking out of the box and going for it, if you look at these people, they're just saying, this is what I'm doing. And we're all going, what? You're going to what? <laughs> Put someone and on the moon like Elon Musk. And Ross. you know what? Exactly. And you know what? That's where creativity is today. So when we talk about the fashion industry and creativity, you have to be on that level to, to really stand out. So no pressure. <laughs> let's, um, let's hear from you guys. Uh, any questions? Don't be shy. Yeah, but if somebody has a question, I could sense it. There we go. 
Hi, I'm Veronica Apson, and I'm um, going to be graduated from FIT in fashion design uh, this May. And um, I'm really inspired by you guys sharing um, all your thoughts and tips and advice um, being as leaders in fashion. And um, I'm, I run my own uh, startup fashion channel in New York City. And um, I want to know how do you guys manage um, like your personal life, your family, and also um, your business because you know you're the top of your your company, and um, it's so hard. Like with being connected with your customers constantly, and there's so many things you have to do. How do you manage? <laughs> <laughs> That's the best question, <laughs> right? Did you yeah, not, you, you yeah. asked the best question. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I'm, I think balance is the impossible task for uh, anybody, I think especially women who have families and relationships and responsibilities. It is, it was the bane of my existence for many, many, many years. And I was failing repeatedly. Um, my relationships lasted maybe two years when I finally would stop pretending that I was going to go home and cook dinner or some stupid thing like that. So I think, I think you need a good partner who is very involved in what they do, and they appreciate what you do, not as a woman, but as a partner in the same way they think of themselves in their world. That was great advice. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I always I always say that you have sort of, especially if you're a working mom, you have sort of three things you're trying to do really well, your kids, your your spouse or significant other, and your job. And the, you, the, the idea of balance of all those three things in a single day is kind of a stupid idea because it's never going to happen and you're just going to constantly feel like a failure. But the idea of being really good at one thing on a particular day can make you feel super successful. So I used to go for the one thing on a particular day kind of rule. Um, so if I was doing whatever I was doing, I did it really well. That one thing, I felt really good. If I ever got two, it was a complete rock star. Um, three is not attainable and sort of a bad goal. Um, so I always sort of thought about it in chunks of time and chunks of a day and where I could put my focus and sort of recognize the fact that that is a sort of a balancing act. And, it really takes, for me, it was always about like organization and thinking forward and not five years forward, but like six months. And my kids would always make fun of me. They would say, what am I doing April 25th? I go, oh, that's a Tuesday. And you will be like, I would know literally four months in advance exactly where we were going to be and what we're going to do. But that was what helped me get through it was sort of to plan it and know it and organize it and try to really stay on that, try not to think too far ahead. I used to I always tell my, the women who work with me with kids, like, no future fear. Stop thinking about what's going to happen. Well, what happens when I have to drop them off next year? You'll figure it out. That's next year. You can't really worry about that. You have to really just take it in small chunks of time. Um, uh, I have a friend who says if you do one good thing or one thing a day, yeah. it's 365 things in a year. Yeah, it's a, a lot, lot of things. <laughs> I, you know, look, you also have to look around and, you, you know, look at people and go, okay, they did it. This was always my thing. I'd look around and go, okay, they did it. I can do it. I know I can do it. So you just have to think like that. It's, and not consider yourself a failure if you didn't do it all in a single day. I really appreciate that because as a high achiever, as high achievers, we tend to always, at the end of the day, evaluate what we did and say, oh, but I wish I did that and I wish I did that. But I love the advice of taking one day at a time and, you know, one thing at a time, and even if you accomplished one thing in the day that was spectacular, um, that's enough to go to bed happy at night, so yeah. thank you. <laughs> you know, I, I want to add something because it, it really goes into a, an issue that is becoming more and more important. I interview a lot of women, and, um, and a reoccurring issue that I hear, especially for moms, um, is that, that if there's that little white lie, they have to tell their boss when their kid's sick and then something else happens and they're lying and lying and lying and 
um, and they hate it and they don't know how to handle it. They just don't want to be standing out because they have all of these responsibilities that are not workplace responsibilities. And so I, I think that there's an important um, conversation to have, and that's honesty. And um, in my company, it's easier because it's all women and I'm a woman, but I think having to say, this is, this is what's happening for me right now, and I'm, I'm gonna handle it. My kid has this issue that may last for a month or two months. I may not be as reliable with time, but I can do some work at home. I can do this and this. So there's, there's a conversation about alternative um, achievements that can be accomplished. And we've made accommodations. I mean, we have a place where people breastfeed. We have, you know, we can do that easily. There's the breastfeeding room, and everybody's like lining up to go in there. And then, but then there, there are, there are occasions where we're offering people an opportunity to work from home for a period of time or for as long as they like, and they have goals that they have to achieve at home or at work. So I think you can have these conversations, um, but being honest, I know when somebody's lying, and I'm like, are you really telling me the truth? I'm here to help you. But you may not get that same conversation in a different organization. So I do think the truth with solutions is a good idea. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, I had someone come to me this morning and she's like, I'm resigning. I'm like, wait, what? Why? She will I have some personal issues I have to deal with. And she goes, I mean, I'm going to work part time someplace I'll consult and maybe I'll come back in three months. I was like, you want to come back in three months? You need, you need this period of time for, and she was willing to talk to me about what it was. I was like, Let's work out this part-time thing so you can go do what you need to do, and then you come back. But like, if I hadn't even asked, she was just going to resign. Yeah. This is, this, and so it led to a much better conversation, and for us, a much better outcome. I don't want this person to leave. Mm -hmm. I also think there's, an, there's another side to the honesty, which is honesty with both your partner and your kids. And, you know, particularly with my kids, like, they grew up when I was running, for the most part, were little, when I was running a television network and involving them and talking to them about everything I was doing, where I was going and why I was doing it, and not like sneaking out the door in the morning and you know trying not to include them. And it got to the point where when my kids' friends would come to the house and if they started talking about television, I'd say, why did you like that show? Like, please don't talk about television in front of my mother because she's gonna ask you so many questions. But that you know they knew where you know what cable operator operated one city like when they were a little kid they understood Nielsen ratings I mean that was yeah. the way they grew up because the conversation was in the house so what that does a lot is it doesn't make it feel so separate and foreign um, instead of saying to them every day how was school today I'd say I gotta tell you what happened today at work half the time I think it was way over their heads but they're pretty fluent in television these days and I don't <laughs> mean what shows they're watching. So I think, you know, not trying to create all those boundaries and separations and, you know, being honest with your boss and telling them what's going on and why. And look, you know, if you have the same person keeps coming in and telling you the same thing all the time after a while, you're gonna be like, hmm, yeah. this isn't working. <laughs> but if it's someone who, if you're working hard and you're and you're obviously dedicated to what you're doing, most situations can be worked out in part because of technology. Mm. I mean, I remember as a young Lawyer, if you had to finish a document, you're not even going to believe this, but if you're working on a document, you ha there was a place in the building called word processing, and you would bring your document down with your handwritten changes on it, and they would make the changes in the document, and you would sit in your office and wait until word processing, because there weren't even faxes, you had to wait till word processing had finished the edits on your document in your office. You would, I mean, gosh, like, it's like ridiculous. It's like Stone Age. Um, so technology makes a lot more of this possible, I think, because you can be a lot of different places and it doesn't matter. Yeah, especially if some uh, if one person in particular um, is such an asset to the company and I said, you're such an asset, I, 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 I'm not going to... I'm, I'm, I'm not going to not help you. You help me every day. We have to figure out a solution. 
So uh, I think those open conversations, it's a, it, this is really a new topic, and, um, and I think we'll be hearing more about it. So uh, technology empowers this yeah. new culture, yeah. but you have to put your mobile device to bed. You it, need <laughs> some restoration. Separation. I have to preach this to myself every night, too. Any, uh, any other questions? Hi, uh, my name is Elise. I just want to thank you guys for coming in today. Um, so you're saying that uh, it's great to be transparent with your bosses, and I've had a lot of different jobs in my, I'm 22, almost 23 in my lifetime so far, um, but I just moved to New York in August, and it's a very different culture here. So would you say that it's more understanding in the city rather than somewhere in the suburbs about those kinds of things because they know they have people have lives or are they more expected to be you know on their game all the time what can i ask where you came from moved from i moved from connecticut so okay. not not too far, not too far. but okay. different culture definitely I, I don't think it i think every company is different and the leadership is different and uh it's not a it's not a general statement i'm wondering i have a question for you, you you're 22 and you've had many jobs. That does like a big red sign went over your head. What were the jobs and how long did you work at each job? Um, so I would, do you wanna hear each one? Absolutely, <laughs> okay. absolutely. Um, so I started out in retail when I was 16 um, at Madewell and J. Crew, and I stayed there for about two, two and a half years. Um, and I had internships throughout college, um, you know, so they were very short term and they were expected to be short term. Um, part of them were my decision, part of them were not my decision. Um, and since I've moved to the city, I've had, I volunteered at Fashion Week, I um, had a part time job or a temporary seasonal job at Tommy Hilfiger. Um, and now I'm like interviewing for a lot of Good. different jobs now. So. Much better to know the background on that. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, that's mm -hmm. very ambitious. Thank you. Um, yeah, Question to you. Hi, my name is Maria, and I just wanted to know um, what advice can you offer um, to someone who wants to launch their own line? So, as a future designer, what advice can you offer? I have a question. <laughs> Tell us. What makes your line better than everybody else's, or more unique, or more desirable, or so special? Well, I'm just looking to um, really get into the vegans, and I want my line to stand out by just being a vegan line and having like vegan leather and just alternatives for people that want. Um, stuff with quality but still stylish but can still be considered vegan so i think that's what might give me the edge. good for you good for you congratulations i wish you a lot of luck i and not just luck you know a lot thank you i think i mean i've been telling people this a lot lately which is i think it's great to want to go do your own thing i think there's something to be said for working with people with some experience before you go off and do your own thing. Um, because I think, and I actually said this to people, if, you, if that's what you're after, to go work for an established company as opposed to a startup, and I've run startups, but I do believe that you might get more experience management and a, more, a better learning experience for yourself. You get something behind you. If you just go off and do your own thing, you don't have that experience. It's much more difficult to be as credible in the space. So are you suggesting more of a startup or a corporate setting? Uh, more of an established company if what you're looking for is experience. Mm -hmm. You know, an interesting thing, um, a, a young woman who is a fashion designer, um, probably in your age group, um, came recommended to me to work for the company and I said, you know, you're gonna hate it here because 
I still do the fashion. I still design the collection. That's why I still do this. I love it. So you're going to look at me and say, I'm better than she is. Why am I not doing this? And she is. And, I don't know. and so I'm happy to have you here for three months. And then in three months, you have to find your design career. You have to figure out what you want to do. But it's a three-month deal. So three months is up. I sent her an email. I said, three months is up. I'm so excited for you. <laughs> um, and she wrote me back the longest, longest, longest um, email. But it was really so brilliant because she answered this question. She said, what I've learned in three months is really telling me I have so much to learn. I didn't realize I loved another part of this business that I never really learned about in school. And I love every second of it. And I want to work more with you. I enjoy the time with you. And I thought that was very, um, it wasn't a cop out. She's not a scaredy cat personality. It was, you know what? I, I have shit to learn. I have to really like get it down. So I, I'm so <coughs> proud of her for really writing an intelligent uh, email, not just, you know what? Can I work another six months, three <laughs> months? I'm a little bit afraid of what's out there. No, she really uh, analyzed what had happened in the last three months. And I thought she would go. Because when she came in, she was pretty sure that she would start her own company or be a designer. In a, in, and now she's looking at it with great perspective. Thank you. I think we're out of time. Great. Thank you for your time. Very of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.